And here we have it. The man of the hour. The New York City. Baltimore native. And back to New York City. And wherever he's at right now. Please welcome. <laughs> working actor Lawrence Gilliard Jr. How are you, baby? Woo woo! Woo woo! <laughs> What's happening, brother? I'm I'm good, man. I'm good. You know, de- just like everybody else, dealing with this Corona thing. You know, that's it. Dealing with the COVID. No, I hear you, man. <laughs> so you know, Lawrence, I I'm a big fan of yours, especially with other people out there that loves your characters and what you played in, and all the TV shows and films. But yeah. let's turn back the clock. How Uh-oh. did it start? Uh oh, turning back the clock. Yes. Okay. You grew up in New York City, but you moved to Baltimore at seven, right? What yeah. happened there? So what happened was, you know, the parents split. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and mom, mom was from uh, Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And so she moved back home to Baltimore, and she had two kids, me and my sister, my my first sister at the time. And so we moved back to Baltimore. I was seven years old, you know. Um, Still very much a New Yorker. What's funny is when I got to when I got to Baltimore, you know, I had my New York accent. I was all about New York. And people down here, all the kids down here were calling me country because they didn't know where the <laughs> accent was from. <laughs> I was like, I'm country. They're like, Yeah, you 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 talk country. I'm like, no, you talk country. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but here's my question, Lawrence. In Baltimore, don't they have a little of a New York accent, just a little bit? No. No. <laughs> oh, okay. No. Nah, you know, Baltimore Baltimore has a has a specific thing, you know. It's real it's real different. It's just specific. It's its own little thing that Baltimore has that they do and that's what it is, you know. And sometimes I mean, you know, I do the Baltimore thing, but then sometimes the New York sneaks in just because, you know, I got like apple cider running through my veins or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's my question. Did you play sports when you were a kid? Oh, man. I played all the sports. And I excelled at all the sports. I played baseball, football, basketball. I shot pool. I played ping pong. And I had trophies in all the sports that I played. Uh, But then one day, you know, I switched to music. And when I switched to music, my music teacher was like, you have to make a choice. He said, because you could go out, you know, at the time I was playing football, he's like, you could go out, you could break a finger, and then there's no more no more music. So you got to decide which one you want to do. And so I chose the, the music. I chose the clarinet, chose the horn. So what made you fall in love with the clarinet? I mean, did you like, did you see other instruments that you were like, oh, I like this because it looks nice? I actually like how a clarinet looks, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get rid of this first because I'm melting in this thing. It- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're all melting on the East Coast right now. <laughs> so, um, but so, you know, it was actually really a matter of fate the way the clarinet came on. I, I always wanted to play drums. And I'm also, I'm actually a self-taught drummer as well. So I do play drums. But when I was a kid, you know, everybody wanted to play the drums because all the girls like the drummers, you know? Well, I, I played I played the drums, too. I, I remember those days, yeah. You got to do a jam session, bro. Oh, yeah. Especially when you have the solo. You know? You know? <laughs> so I show up to school. I'm like, I want to play drums. We already got enough drummers. I'm like, all right, well, I want to play guitar then. Hmm. So I'm playing guitar, and then my music teacher comes to the practice room one day, and he goes, we need another clarinet player in the band. So he takes my guitar, he gives me a clarinet. And that's how, you know, and what 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 really happened, what that happened, he gave me the clarinet, said, I want you to learn this to play in the band, because we need clarinet players. And then at that time, we only had one television in my house, and that television broke. And that was my only, you know, that was my escape. So because the TV was broke, the only thing I had to do was play the clarinet, practice. So... <laughs> So I would just learn songs on the clarinet, and I just kept getting better and better and better. What did like? How many hours did you spend on? Oh man, clarinet? that used to be, yeah, that used to be my life. Like the clarinet, especially when I got to high school, the high school level. You know, I and and it was it was a little bit weird being in my hood because I actually grew up in West Baltimore, where the wire took place, like where 
you know, the area that they were writing about is the area that I actually grew up in. Wow. So it's like, you know, those projects, the Lexington Terrace projects, where the Barksdales worked, I played Little League football for the Lexington Terrace squad. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. That, that... That's how close I was to that whole world, you know? <clears throat> so you, you're really familiar so with that. Here, coming... Huh? You, you were really familiar with that world then. Oh, yeah. No, nah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And that's what made it a little bit, you know, that's why I could feel it a little bit more just because I actually grew up in it, you know, and I knew cats. I knew all those cats, mm -hmm. you know, I knew cats who grew up in that life. But it was kind of hard for me uh, switching over to clarinet and classical and coming home and carrying the clarinet every day. You know, my homies would come and ring the bell, you know, come, come and play basketball, come play football, play, you know, come play. And I couldn't play anymore. I was, had the clarinet. And eventually the doorbell stopped ringing. They stopped inviting me to come and hang out. You know, my whole life just kind of shifted. And uh, it was it was very hard, you know, at the time. It was a little bit weird at the time. Um, but, you know, it, overall, looking back, it was it was an amazing, a, a great thing, you know. <clears throat> so when you went to high school, it was like a performing arts in Baltimore, right? In high school in Baltimore? Yeah. The, right? Baltimore school for the arts, yes. And here's, here's what's crazy. Tupac and Jada Pinkett? Was there at the same time as you, or they went to the same school as you? We all went to the same school, but we were not there at the same time. Oh, okay. Now, I am not going to say who was there first. Mm. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you, if they did go to high school with you, I was like, are they were they that good back in school? You know what I mean? Like, did you witness? But I guess... I'm going to tell you, nobody goes in. Everyone goes into that school with talent. Okay. But, you know, you get trained. Like, it's a serious, rigorous program, that school. You know, it's an arts and academic school. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I love about that school, like, that school really changed my life. You know, that school taught me my, amazing, my, my work ethic that my wife and my kids always tell me about what an amazing work ethic I have. Well, I learned it there at that school. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that school took me basically out of the hood and introduced me to a whole new world, you know, and right. all different types of people. It's a very diverse school, so mm -hmm. all different types of people. But it definitely trains you. You get trained in that school, so, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. When you were walking with your clarinet in the hood, like, you know how in the hood yeah. an athlete wear, has his helmet? They're not going to mess with him. Were you that right. same guy, too, with the clarinet? Well, by that time that I started playing the clarinet, everybody kind of, they knew who I was, so they weren't messing with me anyway. By that point, I'd already established myself as, you know, a hood kid. So, okay. <laughs> but, you know, I was you know, thinking, you, <laughs> you know, I was thinking, Lawrence, were you like, respected. wait, say that again? I said I was already respected in my hood. Oh, so you earned your stripes then. I already did, right. Oh, okay. So by that point, it was just like, you know, he's doing this new thing. A lot of people did, though. They were like clarinet, classical, you know, time to switch up to that jazz, play right. the jazz. But um, I think what that made me do was that actually just made me focus on classical more and just want <laughs> right. to do classical more. And, you know, I'm like, look, I'm a classical musician and just accept that. That's what I do, you know? So were you like Kenny G on the streets in the corner trying to make money with the clarinet? <laughs> You know what? By the time I got to Juilliard in the summertime, two close friends of mine, we would do a clarinet trio and we would go into Central Park and play for money. Absolutely. During the summer, you, you know, that? you're hustling, man. <laughs> you're a starving college student. You got to hustle. Listen, Juilliard, let me tell you something, man. That, you, I mean, that's one of the top schools in the world, man. But, yeah. you know, it was for music, uh, mostly voice, right? Voice and speech, music, and also acting. But then, what made you say, hmm, after you graduated from Juilliard, well, I think I like to portray characters now. What happened? What stimulated you? Well, you know, it wasn't it wasn't so much. What happened is when, while I was in Juilliard, mm -hmm. you know, all classical musicians, they know that the, the day you wake up and you don't want to practice, there's a problem. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so one day I woke up and I'm like, I don't feel like practicing today. And that was the day that I knew there was an, there was something going on. And 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 I was kind of going crazy because, you know, I didn't want to play. I didn't want to practice. I was, you know, kind of losing it in school a little bit. 
And then, like now, looking back in retrospect, I know what I was going through. And basically what happened is I had gotten bored yeah. with the horn and with the music. You know, classical is a very structured thing. Right, yeah. You, know? you have to play it a specific way. And, and after a certain amount of time playing it, like you can tell what the chord changes are going to be, what's going to happen next. You've listened to all the music, you know. <clears throat> um, and so I got bored. And, uh, and then I started thinking, all right, what else do I want to do in my life? Mm -hmm. And then I remembered that when I was in high school, I went to see all my high school drama productions. And when I was in college at Juilliard, I would go and see all the Juilliard drama productions. And I started thinking to myself, hmm, maybe there's something here that I need to look into. So I took a, a summer acting course at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, just a summer intensive. And by the end of that intensive, I really kind of knew. I was like, wow, I can do so much more through this medium. Yeah. I can give so much more, share so much more. The sky's sort of the limit with this, you know, where I felt like uh, with the clarinet, I was being held back a little bit. So that's when I kind of decided, you know, I'm going to do this other thing because I can do more with it. So the, now, the Juilliard, uh, as far as the schedule, Lawrence, was it like, Give me the schedule when you're like, what is it, your third year, I guess? Is it like clarinet all day, eight hours a day? I mean, what was it like? <laughs> I want to hear this. You wake up in the morning, then what? So, you know, it's like college is college. So you have a lot of time between courses, mm -hmm. you know, um, when you're in college. But in between those courses, they're expecting you to be practicing or learning music or working on music. And when you're in a school of that caliber like that and you're dealing with other musicians at that level, mm -hmm. that's all you're talking about and that's all you're doing. I mean, you know, as you know, with all things, with sports, with life, with everything, you're, it's constant learning. You can never learn enough and know enough. Mm -hmm. So with music, it's the same thing. It's like you're talking about, you know, playing music, different songs, scales. You're talking about different musicians. You're talking about the history of music. Your, it, your whole day is inundated with music. Right. And even even when you sleep at night with your roommate, right? You're still talking about it. What we're going to do tomorrow, right? Exactly. It's like, yo, what piece are you going to play for your recital? What piece are we playing in orchestra? You know, what part did, did you get? It's it's just constant. It's constant. That's what you're doing. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, no, when you're dealing right. when you yeah, when you're dealing with kids on that level, with, with cats on that level, it it motivates you, really, because you know, I'm going to tell you, I was, it was funny because I did an interview recently with someone who I went to Juilliard with, another clarinetist, who's now, he's the principal clarinetist of the Hong Kong um, Symphony, wow. right? And so I interviewed with him last week, and we were talking about how you could be sitting in an orchestra, and orchestra's like 100 or more people, you know, 50, 60, 100 people, and the conductor can stop the orchestra and will point to you and say, play your line from here to here. And the whole orchestra is listening silently as you play your part. So you better be, you know, on your P's and Q's and have all your I's dotted and T's crossed and know what you're doing and know your music. You know, it's very serious, the world of classical music. <laughs> like, it's yeah. very serious. So, mm -hmm. so summertime, you, you took the intensive. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you went to Stella Adler. You decided to go there for the conservatory no. acting school? No, 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 no. So I took that intensive at American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Mm -hmm. And then I came back to Juilliard and, you know, I was kind of forcing uh -huh. my way through Juilliard doing the music thing. And then by my senior year, I kind of knew this isn't what I, I'm not a clarinet. I don't want to play clarinet in the New York Philharmonic anymore, you know? <laughs> right. So I started taking classes at um, the acting studio, James Price's acting studio. And I studied um, uh, Meisner there. And I finished that right when I was finishing Juilliard. Mm, okay. And then, like, maybe so, I'm not going to give away the year because I'm trying not to date myself here. You can go. So <laughs> shortly after that, I went on an open call for this movie. And back then, you could go on open calls for independent movies. Yeah. You know, you just go and wait online, you know, mm. back in the day. Wait online, and then they'll let you audition. So I ended up getting a role in this movie. It was the lead. The movie was called Straight Out of Brooklyn. It was the starring role. There it is. It was the starring role. Oh, yeah. It went to Sundance. Mm -hmm. It won the special jewelry prize. And that was my foot in the door. And then after that movie came out, I still felt like there was more I needed to learn as an actor. So that's when I went back to school to Stella Adler to oh. work some more. Okay. 
But yeah. you know, straight up, straight out of Brooklyn. You know, I actually saw that film when I was a kid. Did you? Oh shit! Okay, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's him. <laughs> you know, you, you know, you just wanted to get out of the hood, right? Your super objective was, I want to get out of the hood. You know, I want to exactly. get my family out of here, right? That was exactly. your super objective. What did, did you remember? What you did at the audition? Since it was an open call, you were like, you know what? I'm gonna make this choice. I'm sure there was probably like. If it's an open call, there's at least 300 or 400 people auditioning for that. Yeah, man. The line was like around two blocks. It was it was uptown mm-hmm. um, at this art center up in Harlem. Mm-hmm. And the, the lines were around two blocks. And I waited patiently in line. And I got in there. And I just remember, you know, they gave you a sheet. Like, they literally brought you the sheet out that you had to do the audition with while you were standing in line. So it was a cold so yeah, there wasn't really any learning the, the sides and learning the lines. It was really more about looking at it, trying to understand what the character was saying. And then it was just, I really just improv it. <laughs> really? <laughs> I love it. I love my improvisers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I did. I really just improv improved it. And um, and I got the part, which was... And just yeah. like that, there was no callback? They're like, okay, you're the guy. You no, know, there was a callback, but they it was like me. I think I showed up with maybe three other guys or whatever, but I think at that point they kind of knew. Mm-hmm. And they ended up just making me the lead, and then they made the other guys like the friends. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. You know, it's crazy because that picture right there, you can see the Twin Towers right behind you. Is that crazy yeah. or what? And now it's gone, you know what I mean? Yeah, nostalgic, man. That's yeah. right. They were there. They were so, there. Lawrence, after this film, right, and this is the film, this was during, while you were in acting school? During Stella Adler? No, that was right after. That was after the acting studio and before Stella Adler. Oh, okay. So you got that. Then you realize, okay, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. I'm going to go to a conservatory acting school. Right. I was and like, it, I want to learn. Right. Right. Okay. I so, want to learn more and I want to be, you know, I want to get serious. I want to work more on my acting. Like, I know how to do, basically, after my first acting school, I was like, I know how to be me and confident in myself mm-hmm. on screen. But I wanted to learn how to be other people yes. on screen. You know, I wanted to learn how to transform on screen and do different things. So I'm like, all right, I need to go back to school to learn that. So that's why, you know, I went back to Stella Adler and got those chops. Well, since you did a Meisner course in your mm-hmm. past, why did you pick Stella Adler when you have, like, William Esper studio as the Meisner uh, out here in New York City. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you got all these other Meisner technique. What made you pick Stella Adler? Well, I picked Esper first, and they didn't accept me. Oh, shit! <laughs> Yo, we're going to save this, and I'm going to send them this video. Like, look what you did to this gentleman. Are you kidding me? Go ahead. <laughs> so Stella Adler accepted me, so that's where I went. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> All right, so after, when you graduated from Stella Adler, you felt good. You're like, okay, man, I'm ready. Now, mm-hmm. we all know, I'm an actor as well. Back in those days, you're not making any money right now, right? Nope. What was your, how many people did you live with? What was your day job or night <laughs> job? What did you do in New York City? Where did you live? Okay, so <laughs> at that time, I was living with my aunt and my sister. We were living in an apartment building. Up in Harlem. Okay. Um, I was working in a mail room of this law firm called Rogers and Wells in what was then the Pan Am building. It's now the MetLife building. So that's how far we're going back. It was the Pan Am building back then. So the MetLife is where? Is that the Grand Central? Yeah, Grand Central. Okay. MetLife. So it was Pan Am back then. So this law firm, Rogers and Wells, they owned the top five floors of the MetLife building. That's mm-hmm. how big they were. And they were like, they had like 20 guys working in the mail room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like a bunch, a bunch of us. Right. Right. Um, so that's what I was doing. I was just working in the mail room and um, I got the movie straight out of Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I remember getting the movie. The movie came out. They had like, you know, the newspaper. I was like in the newspapers and stuff. So they they were taping the newspaper articles with my picture up around the mail room, you know. <laughs> At first, they're like, oh, he's just a male guy, whatever. Now they see headline of you. They're like, oh, yeah, what's up, buddy? How are you? Whatever you need, we got you, right? All the lawyers, the associates, right. wanted to be my friend. Oh, my God. I'm like, you guys are so fake and phony. Get right. off my face. Right? 
But um, <clears throat> um, I remember one of the receptionists there saying when the movie was coming out, she was like, oh, you're going to be, you're not going to be here long now. I give you, you know, three more months and you'll be out of here. I worked in that job for another year mm. before I left because I didn't book another job. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's so hard, man. I get it. It's hard. So, so finally I booked like two jobs back to back and then I had to leave. But Lawrence, what's your take on auditioning? Are you the type of guy that gets nervous or are you the type of guy like, bring it, I'm here to deliver? Well, I've gone through stages in my life. So there have been stages in my life when I was like, you know, bring it and I'm ready. But there have also been stages in my life where I get very nervous. And I still, I mean, I'd say now, you know, it's all about a mindset. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I do even today, I'll have an audition and I'll freak out about it a little, you know. <clears throat> um, but there's techniques you learn over time. Uh, and one of the amazing things that I learned was, you know, you go into auditions, if you haven't worked in a minute, you go into auditions and you have this attitude, like, I really need this job. Like, you're going in asking for something, you know? I need this job. And they can read it on your face, you know? Someone told me one time, they were like, you know, when you go in for any kind of job interview, and I didn't, no matter what it is, go in not asking for something, but offering something. Right. Like, you know, you are an individual, you're your special thing, you got something special to give, you go in showing them this is what you get if you hire me. Right, right? exactly, yeah. And so that helps me to just be me when I go into the room and do my thing. Because only when I go into the room, I'm the only one who's going to do what I'm going to do. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> You know, you know, it's crazy. I, I tell people I actually enjoy auditioning. I'll tell you why. Because, you know, being a former athlete, it's like, bring it. And you know what? I just make believe I got the job already. So I'm, I'm on set. I just right. make believe right. you know, I'm on the right. job already. You know what I mean? So that's I just part of it. deliver. That's a part of it, you know, yeah. just going in and, and knowing, you know, like I said, just knowing you have something to give. You've done it before. You've been there before. You've worked with pros before. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing to really be worried about. Go in and do your thing. Lawrence, how old were you when you had this scene right here, man? I mean, that, that's a big league right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've been... You, listen, we're gonna, I'm going to go step by step, uh, skip a couple of films, but what, what's it like being with this guy in the movie Trees Lounge? Yes. So Steve Buscemi, that's Steve Buscemi's movie, right. Trees Lounge. He directed and wrote it, right? Huh? He directed it and wrote it. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So that was um, that was a fun, great couple days that I think I did that to do that. Um, mm -hmm. One or two or three scenes I think I did in there. But um, <clears throat> um, I just remember going into the audition. I think Sheila Jaffe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she She's was... The she HBO, was HBO woman. So I remember going in and Steve Buscemi was in there. And I guess they had already talked about me and my work that I, you know, the little work that I'd done at that point. So I went in there. He was like, oh, yeah, I seen you. I saw you uh, um, straight out of Brooklyn. And, you know, I saw. He's like, I'm just going to tell you, put the sides down. We're just looking for somebody who can come in and just wing it with us and have some fun. Wow. And I was like, well, I'm your guy. <laughs> I'm your guy, right? <laughs> and he shook my hand and was like, well, then I'll see you on set. Just like that. It was just like that. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Lawrence, oh. I mean, holy shit. That's great, you know? So what did you learn from Samuel? Like, did he give you any tips or he was like... Oh, man, you know what I learned from that dude? Basically, and I've, you know, we've, we've spoken since this movie. Mm -hmm. Chatted and talked since this movie, but, you know he's one of my idols, like Sam, like he's one of those dudes that I just, I love watching him work and I look up to and, you know, but, uh, I just remember working with him being on set and just thinking to myself, I'm like, I want to be as smart as him one day. Mm -hmm. Like his choices were just so on point. Like every choice he made made sense, you know? And I was just, I was just watching him like, man, I just want to be smart like that one day on set where my choices are, you know, I'm, every choice I make is good and I'm on it every time. But I, <laughs> I remember we literally were improv like that scene right there at the bar. We, me, him and, and, and um, Buscemi and um, 
Oh, uh, what's what's the other cat? Boone. You had some good actors on that in that film. There was a lot of good actors. So we were improving the scene, and they were going back and forth, back and forth. And I'm the new young cat on, and I'm trying to like it was it was almost like double. Dutch, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out how I can jump in, jump in, because they were on it sharp, sharp, sharp. Right. And Sam is like, you know, first they were talking about how you stop the truck or something like that, put brakes on the truck. He was like, first you shift it in the first gear and then blah, you shift down and then you put on the brake. Bah, 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 bah. And they're going back and forth. And then in one of the takes, I just came out and I was like, because they're talking about all this shifting. Mm -hmm. I came out and I said, well, all I want to know is, when do you put on the brake? <laughs> And, right. <laughs> and it was like it was a freeze and then it was some his, you know a little his, hysterical like some laughter and it was like alright cut and then Sam was like alright he got us on that one y'all alright <laughs> <laughs> I love it you, you know what it is but you're so innocent and it's like yeah, yeah. he's got a point <laughs> you know yeah I mean? exactly exactly I was like I finally got one in so here's so, oh, now, now how the hell did you get this film alright so did you have to audition for uh -oh. that or what <laughs> I mean, that was great with Adam Sandler, the water boy. It was. That was so, so that's still the most fun I had on a movie still. Wow. To date. Um, that was an audition. Mm -hmm. It was an audition. It was one audition. I, it was actually an audition on tape. Oh. Okay. So, yeah, I put myself on, in, uh, on tape and they sent it. And then I just heard that I got the role. <laughs> you know who's a good friend of mine? Peter Dante that? that played the quarterback. Dante, yeah, man. Good cat. Good yeah. cat. Good cat. Peter Dante. So how, I love like, all those cats, man. That was that was just so much fun. And that was another movie where I was kind of like holding on to their coattails. Because you know, all those guys are just comedic geniuses, you know, they're so quick with it. And I was literally just holding on and just trying to get, you know, a line. Like if you really watch that movie, I'm the straight guy. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like they're all doing comedy around me. And then I'm the straight guy. Right. <laughs> right? Were you the guy in the film? Were you the, what was your position in, in football? The kicker. I'm the kicker. Oh, you're the kicker. OK. <laughs> well, you got to have that focus. man. It's all up to you, brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's right. <laughs> I was Derek Wallace. Derek Wallace, the kicker. I was his only friend on the team. I let him borrow my helmet. <laughs> Oh man, that movie was hilarious. Plus, with Adam Sandler, his voice and speech, right? He had to, he had to execute that. Yeah. So, yeah, and Adam, man, you know, he he's in, like I said before, just a comedic genius. Like watching that guy work, he's actually very quiet and shy guy, right? Uh -huh. So quiet and shy. And then they say action, and he just turns it on. But he would do things like we'd be doing a scene together, and I'd be writing with my right hand. And he'd lean over and go, if you write with your left hand, it'll be funnier. Stuff like that. <laughs> and I'd be like, what do you mean? He'd go, just, just try it. And I'd do it, and it would be funnier. Like, he just knows funny, wow. you know? He He's a knows. genius. You know, I had yeah. a story with, uh, with um, Adam Sandler. Check this out. I was in yep. Malibu 2017, right? In mm -hmm. Malibu. Uh, what's that sushi joint? Overrated. What's that place called? Oh, um... In Malibu sushi joint. You, um, what's the, I forgot the name. You know that popular one. I'm gonna think of it in a minute. Yeah, but anyway, it's the day of that night. I think that that day, Aaron Boone got signed by the Yankees as the manager. Wow. So Adam's looking at me. I'm Sugar looking at him. Sugarfish. Is that it? What is it? Sugarfish. No, 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 not that one. That one? Um, it's a different one. What's okay. the name of that place? Oh. Nobu, Nobu, that's what it is. Oh, Nobu, yeah, yeah, Nobu, okay. So he looks at me, I look at him, and I'm like, yo, Adam, just like that. I didn't get intimidated, and I was like, yo, Adam, what do you think about the Aaron Boone signing? He's like, holy shit, a Yankee fan out here? He's like, I don't know, what do you think? And I'm like, well, he's got a lot of experience, so I think we'll be fine. He's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, hey, Verlander was here two weeks ago. I wanted to kill him. I was like, well, you should have. He's like, yeah, I should have, right? I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's like that. Yeah, he's, he's funny. Good. He is like the way you described it: shy, quiet, and then boom. The and then boom, yeah. yeah. But he, he, you know, he's just so easy. I ran into him at the Gotham Awards last year. For you know, I hadn't seen him in a long time. It was a little, a little reunion, and um, and uh, Lochran was there too. The other guy who played the dude with the lazy eye. Uh huh. Uh huh. 
he was there too. <laughs> so it was a little mini reunion, but you know, every time like that, that crew, like they get together, it just brings back all those great memories. I keep in touch with Henry Winkler reg- regularly. Yeah, speaking of him, here he is right there. Look, there I got Henry. <laughs> yeah, man. He called me up, um, about what was it like maybe a month ago or so mm. he called me up because he just started watching the wire <laughs> oh just now oh wow <laughs> yeah. he just started watching the wire and uh and, and he was loving the show so he gave me a call but um yeah that was that was a great that was an amazing time and a great great how many, uh how many weeks were you on set i mean that must have been so much fun being playing football Oh yeah, for the water boy. Yeah, I thought that it what it had to be what, a month and a half or so, maybe two months. Or would you guys? Maybe. Where was that shot at? In Orlando. Oh wow! In the summertime. Yeah. Summertime. Oh, it must have been an oven for As you guys. Matter of fact, you see that bandana I have on my head. Uh huh. So one day <laughs> it was so hot, it was sunny out. I had I was wearing that bandana. I went back into my dressing room, into my trailer, and I took the bandana off, and I had a tan from here down. <laughs> I know I know Adam picked on you on that one, right? Did he pick yeah. on you? <laughs> they didn't see it because every time I showed up on set I had the bandana on. Oh, so okay. So I was darker from here down and the rest was a little bit lighter up there. Oh, <laughs> that's hilarious. So let me ask you, how okay, Gangs of New York, right? I mean, listen. Oh, yeah. Did did you audition in front of Scorsese? Was he there or was that like a straight offer? Oh my gosh. So that one, it was sort of like a straight offer too, because I went in, the character didn't have any lines, right? Mm-hmm. So they gave me something to read from Henry Thomas's lines, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> um, the casting director, um, Ellen Lewis. Oh. So I went in, I read the lines from the other character, and two days later, they were like, you're going to Rome. Oh my. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is, oh my god you're pumping and so when I, got, <laughs> when I did get to rome i we, we spent we were eight months in rome shooting gangs of new york believe it or not wow so when i did get to rome and i did meet with Mar- marty and all that he's like you know i know i know there's the, the character doesn't have much to do but don't worry about it we're gonna give him stuff to do we're gonna give you we're gonna give you guys stuff to do <laughs> and i was like all right, all right cool. and, and he would come, come out you know like in scenes that I was in, in certain scenes, and go, what would you do right here? What, what do you think your character would do? What would you do? <clears throat> and we would all just kind of, you know, sit around and be like, I think we would do this. I think we would do that. I think we'd do this. And then just, you know, ad lib, add stuff, and and do our actions, what we were doing. And it was fun. That was another one that was, you know, it was cool to do, just just working with Leo. He was fun. He was a lot of fun. Like to hang, hang out during that time. He was going out a lot. He took me to my first soccer match, Roma versus Lazio, which was awesome. Wow. And um, and we went to, um, and also watching Daniel Day-Lewis work was amazing. <laughs> wow. And, Unbelievable. And Cameron was just hilarious. I loved, loved working with her. And yeah, it was it was a good, good, fun time. Brought my family out there. My daughter turned two in Rome. It was great. So then, now we're going to go, how'd you get the wire? That's what I want to know. Okay. How, how'd that happen? All right. Did they so know you from actually, Baltimore? Look at that mug right there. Look at you. Uh-oh. Did we freeze a little bit? No, no. I'm still here. You're good. Oh, no. No, no. Stay there. Stay there. Stay there. You'll get it. Wait a minute. I, see I hear you, but we're not moving. I see Okay, you. there we are. We're back. I see you. I see you. You're good. Okay, good. Yeah, good. yeah. I see. Go ahead. So, so that was very close together. Like, right when I got back from, um, from Rome, mm-hmm. like, the audition for The Wire came up. Okay. Right. And so I remember my agent called me and he's like, David Simon, you know, he did that show, The Corner, and now they've got a new series is going to be on HBO. And guess where it's going to be shot? I'm like, where? Baltimore. (laughs) And so I'm like, all right, you know, send me the script, whatever. So they send me the script and I read it and I literally know the streets. Like, you know, I'm like, I know this block. I know this neighborhood. I know. And I'm just like, I got to get this part. (laughs) You know, I like I just, I'm too familiar with it. I need to get this part. Was this, so the most, I went in, was, well, hold on a minute. Was this the most exciting? Like, was this a do or die for you? I'm like, I got to play this guy, right? When you read the script, you're like, oh my God, it's in my, you know, where I grew up. I know the streets. I know the hood. I know I have to get this part, right? You would think it like that, right? 
absolutely was. That's one of the few parts where I was actually thinking, if they don't hire me for this role, they're doing a, a grave disservice. Like, I, there's nobody who can do this like me. Like, right. <laughs> right? Because I just had that kind of connection with the material and with the, the area, you know? Um, <clears throat> so I went in, I had two auditions. The first one I went in, it was just me and Alexa Fogel. Mm -hmm. And then I got the call back. It was with um, Ed Burns, David Simon, and Bob Colesbury, God rest him, who's passed. Right. But, um, and, and with, um, oh my gosh, what's his name? The director. Uh, gosh, he would slap me in the back of the head right now if he knew that I was forgetting oh, oh, his boy. name. Hey, this, is, this is live right now, but he's watching. Uh-oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> His name's gonna come to me. Oh my gosh, I can't. But um, he was in there, so I go in, I do it, I, I do. You know, when you do those auditions, and you feel like you did exactly what you wanted to do, like you feel really good about it. Mm -hmm. So I went in, I did it, I felt really good about it. And then David Simon, he's like, you know, being in Baltimore, I'm in Baltimore. Baltimore's a small town, you know, small city. We had mutual friends that we knew. Oh, wow. And so David was like, do you know so-and-so? I'm like, oh, yeah, I know her. Yeah, I absolutely do. Yeah, and you also know so-and-so. I'm like, yes, I know him too. I know him, sure. And he goes, and you know so-and-so. And I go, Mr. Simon, I'm sorry. I don't know him. But what I do know is Baltimore, like that. Yeah. I think you got the part for that. <laughs> he broke the room, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> And then, um, oh my gosh, why can't I think of this dude? Now I'm looking right at his face. He was, a, and he, you know, he played a he played a reporter in the fifth season of The Wire with my wife in the in the in the newsroom, and he directed the pilot in the first episode. And I can't even think. Oh my gosh! <clears throat> All right, don't worry, anyway, the name will come. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. It'll come back. But he asked me a few questions. And then that was the end of that. I went out, and there was a bunch of other cats out there in the hall waiting to go in. And I don't know, it was maybe hours. Maybe the next day I got the call, and they were like, yeah, you got it. And oh, then, God. That's and I felt good about it. Yeah, I, felt really, I felt really great about it. But I, I got to tell you, you know, shooting the show, shooting the pilot, and shooting the show in the beginning, I don't think anybody had any idea. It was so different mm -hmm. from everything else that had been on television that I was like, this show is going to be a flop. <laughs> now, everybody thought that in the beginning. Everybody. But you know what, Lawrence? A lot, I talked to a lot of undercover cops, uh, you know, and they said out of all the hood films or TV, that was mm -hmm. the closest to the T. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. really connected. People were like, yo, Eddie, you watched The Wire? I'm like, not yet. Oh, my God, yo, it's off the hook. You know what I mean? And what's great is you met your wife on set and two more two years, two more years, you're gonna have your twenty-fifth anniversary of your marriage, right? Oh no, 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 no. That didn't happen like that. So go ahead. Clark Johnson, that's the director's name, first of all. Clark Johnson. Oh, you see, it came back. Love, <laughs> Love you, Clark. Sorry, bro. All right. But um I met my wife long before that show. Oh, okay. <laughs> How come they said they, you met her at The Wire instead of The Wire? I read that. I was like, really? Okay. No, 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 no. We'd known each other by the time our daughter had been born. When I was shooting the first season of The Wire, our daughter had already been born. Because like I said, I brought my wife and my daughter to Rome with me. That was way, that was before The Wire. Okay. We've been together. My wife has been, we've been together since... We met two weeks after Straight Outta Brooklyn came out. Is that her? That's her. Look at that. That was, that was the wedding day. That was Did wedding you see day. that? I want to know who hit on who. Did you hit You're on her or she hit on you? Oh, man. I You know I hit on her, man. She, <laughs> she, didn't, want, she didn't want anything to do with me when she met me. But, you know, I, I, I put on the charm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're like, come on, she give me a chance. Come on, please. I mean, come on. <laughs> exactly. I was pretty much it, begging. I was begging. <laughs> <laughs> so, in The Wire, what's it like working with this guy right here? I mean, this guy, he's a London guy, right? Yeah. Can't even tell he's from London. I mean, he just... Yeah, no. So, speak. I mean, you know, in the beginning, like, that was the first season. Like, you know, it may even be the pilot, but in the first season... Nobody knew Idris. Like, you know, a lot of those cats were 
it was first time, you know, yeah. it was their biggest thing. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, they were introduced in the wire. Right. You know, I was meeting like Wendell Pierce and uh, Wood Harris, I think, and, and, and um, uh, you know, there were a few people who had been a little more established. You know, I was one of those cats who had been around, like people had seen me in The Water Boy. People had seen me in, you know, so I was a little bit more established. But Idris, like Idris, Michael B. Jordan, yeah, yeah. Michael K. Williams, like there were a lot of cats who it was, you know, they were introduced during that show. So we were all, I mean, that was the kind of show where there were no egos. There was nothing. It was really all just about trying to be true to the story mm -hmm. and to be honest and to just be the best you could be. Everybody showed up to that set with egos checked. <laughs> you know and so it was just about you know just doing great work and everybody knew that everybody was bringing their a, a game every single day every single scene and that's what it was like working with Idris and working with Wood and working with Michael B. Jordan Michael K. with Andre Royo right. with Sonia Song everybody you know was bringing their a game with Wendell Pierce bringing their a game every day and that's what made it amazing. You know, you can tell it. You can tell it when you're watching it. Oh, yeah. You guys sat. You were all connected. You were all truthful. You know, yeah. Dominic Lombardozzi's character. <laughs> no, I love that dude. I love that dude. And, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy because some cats, you know, like I've been fortunate enough that I got to do that show. And there were so many of us on that show. And you get to see the work that they're doing now. You, you, mm -hmm. Like I got the opportunity to watch them grow. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. to watch the actors grow. And Dominic Lombardozzi is one of those guys. I mean, that dude used to show up on set and he'd be like, Larry, Larry, come over here, Larry. And then <laughs> I'd go over there and he'd be like, how does this sound? He'd, be, he'd read his lines and he was like, you know. But that's what, you know, a great, a, a really good actor, you know, <laughs> we're all so insecure about what we're doing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, how you need that reading service, right? <laughs> reassurance exactly and you know he he was he was uh very serious about his work wanted to get it absolutely 100 percent right mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you know just doing just doing an outstanding outstanding job then you had guys like seth gilliam you know seth gilliam is a is a freaking master yeah i watched seth i saw seth gilliam in, in shakespeare in the park, park um with denzel washington doing like henry the eighth or something they were doing and i was like who is this guy and then now I'm working with him and I'm getting to see him work on set. And he's just like a master at his craft, Seth Gilliam, you, you know, yeah. <clears throat> um, he ain't asking no questions. He knows exactly what he's doing yeah. in every beat. He knows what he's doing, you know. So it was just one of those special, uh, special shows. You and know, I was just very blessed, fortunate to be a part of it. Lawrence, you know. You opened up the. Sh I mean, you were in the first season, right? And the way you were looking in the courtroom, and I always mm -hmm. tell actors, it's not the lines, man. It's the experience. Look what you're experiencing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. even though you have no lines, but your face is showing. Like, <laughs> am I gonna get out of here? Or am I gonna stay in? You know what I mean? Am I gonna get out? Like, you're really experiencing that. That was important. well, you know. Yeah. I mean, I always tell, I always tell actors, you know, it's, it's what's in between the lines. Yes. That's, you know, and what a lot of people don't know and what a lot of young actors just coming, you know, what they're learning and what you got to understand is acting is like 95% listening. It's really <laughs> Meisner, it is. baby Meisner technique. I love it. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's what it is though. It's like mm -hmm. 90 something percent listening and then responding honestly. Right. Mm -hmm. People come up, uh, Actors have come up to me and they're like, how do you do it? How, are you, how is it that you can be so real? And I'm like, because I'm really listening. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm really responding. And then I'm really waiting for an answer. Right. It's all, you know, it's yeah. all real. And if you can do that and be in those moments, you know who told me that actually? Lawrence Fishburne. I got the opportunity when I was very young. I called up Lawrence Fishburne. He gave me his number. We were at the Boys in the Hood premiere, actually. Wow. And I was in front of him, and I turned around. I'm a big fan. I love you. Can I get your number? He kind of looked me up and down, and then he gave me his number. <laughs> and so I called him, and he talked to me for like, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. And then at the end of the conversation, he's like, you know, when you're in a scene, do you know what it feels like to really be in that scene? 
And I'm like, yeah, I do. I know what it feels like. And he's like, well, just keep being in the scene and you'll be fine. And what being in the scene is, is just be really listen to what the other actor is saying and really responding. If you're really doing that, you're in the moment and you can't be false. You're right about that because that's what I learned at the conservatory acting school where I went was called the Maggie Flanagan Conservatory in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my acting teacher always said that, you know, you have two ears and one mouth and the two ears have much more power than your one mouth. So yeah. you might as well use <laughs> right. those airs. You know what I'm saying? Because you know that's the only way you're going to answer truthfully is by listening. That's right. So yeah, that's I totally it. agree. So now let's go to the the another hit show. Holy shit! You know, there's a lot of thus, thus, the water boy, uh, the wire. <laughs> now we go to the Walking Dead. Now, now listen. Oh uh, god! Yes. So, holy shit! The, the fans. It's amazing how people are in love with this show. All right. Yeah. So, auditioning straight offer or did you audition okay. no so i did audition for that uh-huh that wasn't that was not a straight offer i did audition for that and actually in honor of you with your cigar i have a cigar right here oh wow this cigar was given to me by the late great scott wilson who played herschel on the walking dead wow okay and who i absolutely love and adore mm -hmm. And he gave it to me. We, I was supposed to smoke it. Like we were supposed to smoke it on that day with him. But but I, he was like, well, just hold on to it and we'll smoke it another day. And I was like, all right, cool. And uh, unfortunately, he passed <laughs> before we could enjoy this cigar. But I will keep it and love it and cherish it forever. From Scott Wilson. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, God bless. Wow. Uh, so The Walking Dead... I um at that time that was a time in my life where I was kind of like I had just come out of a weird place where I was like I, I need a gig right I had just done a recurring on another show and I had just I had gone through this stage where I was kind of bombing in my auditions and I had just gotten to a place where I was like all right I had gone back to my um gone back to not my roots but gone back to my basics basically I should say my basics of acting and you know trying to figure it all out, which I actually learned from Tiger Woods. <laughs> wow. I mean, that story with Tiger Woods. <laughs> well, I didn't learn it. I was reading an article about Tiger Woods. I was bombing in my auditions, and I was reading this article about Tiger Woods, and Tiger was like, you know, his putting was off. His putting. He just couldn't get it right. It was all wrong. And he's like, you know, what I decided to do was just go back to my basic, my very basic putt, when I used to do when I was young. And everything straightened out, <laughs> right? Well, you, you, and I was like, yeah. So it was that article. Then it was actually another article about a basketball coach, who all the basketball players, whenever their game starts going off, they go to this basketball coach for advice. And the basketball coach, he was saying, he's like, you know what? Basketball is a simple game. It's dribble, pass, and shoot. That's it. He's like, but these guys get into the NBA, they change up everything, they get fancy. He's like, but basketball is simple. If they go back to their basics, then they'll be able to shoot a free throw again. Right. right? Yeah, yeah. But you, you, so, know, you know what's crazy, Lawrence? It's the same thing in baseball. You know, I play college baseball down in Florida, and I had a scholarship and everything, right? It's the same thing. When yeah. you're slumping, they're like, Eddie, let's go back to the basic. Stop thinking. Right. Just go back you to know? the Simple. Simplicity. Right. But it's so amazing. I went back to you. Know, it's ama it on, is. amazing how... You're, you know, you're well established at the time already, and you were yeah. bombing yeah. a little bit. And you see, actors yeah. have slumps too. I get it. I've been there. Absolutely. 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 It's a part. It's a part of that 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 roller coaster. A part of that life. You know, is ups and downs. And when you know, you got to understand, you're competing with a whole bunch of other people. I mean, people think the acting life is easy, but it's not. It's hard. You're basically going going into a room to be judged. Every single oh, that's what your audition is. <laughs> exactly. You're going to be, that's your life. You know, uh -huh. people are judging you for a living. You know, that's what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, so, I get it. <laughs> so I, I, I just gone back to my basics and figuring out what is this character one and what is he really doing and all that kind of stuff. And then I got that sh this one show um, called Army Wives, and I just finished doing a recurring on that. And then the audition came up for The Walking Dead. Now, the character in The Walking Dead, Bob Stuckey, if anybody knows the comic, knows the graphic novel, 
Bob Stuckey is a middle-aged white man. Right, okay. In the, in the book. So when I went in, there was another guy there reading for the same part, and he was a middle-aged white man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, they now, I, shot. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't read, I didn't read the comic at the time. Mm-hmm. And when I heard I was going for the audition, I purposely didn't watch the show, and I purposely didn't read the comic because I didn't want to know anything about it. I wanted to just go in fresh. I went in. I did my first audition with just the casting, and it was so good. It went really well. It was so good that they asked me to do it again. They were like, do it again because we didn't even know that the sides could sound like that. So do it again. (laughs) Man, look at you. (laughs) So, So I did it again, and then they brought me back two days later, I think. Now, mind you, let me say this also. My wife is a huge Walking Dead fan at the time. Like, she started from day one. She pressured you. You better get this. <laughs> I didn't tell her that I was auditioning for it. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't even tell her because I was like, I, can't, I just couldn't tell. I was like, I can't tell her that I'm going in for this role because then there really be, there will really be pressure. <laughs> right, right. You're like, I don't need this pressure. <laughs> I don't, right? so, I went, so I went in for the second audition. It was me and it was one other guy, another brother, and um, I remember I was in the hall and I kept going over and it was a very emotional scene and I was kind of emoting a lot in the hall and I didn't want to blow it. Like I didn't want to give, you know, my audition in the hallway. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I had to hold on to it and pull it back a little bit. And then I went into the room, I did the audition and I remember after I finished the audition, the, they started asking me some questions and I didn't answer any. I was just like, yeah, I was answering yes and no's because I didn't want to say anything dumb and like ruin my upper chance, right? Mm-hmm. So I was like, yes, no, yes, no. And then at the end, the casting director said, well, how do you feel about Atlanta in the summertime? And that's when I knew I got the part right there in the room. <laughs> What'd you answer? What'd you say? Oh, I love Atlanta. Did you say that? I was like, I love Atlanta in the summertime. Yeah, even though it's an <laughs> oven, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you did Walking Dead, and I guess this scene, I mean, this picture right here, was this the your final, uh, uh, how you got killed or something like that? Yeah, that was one of the final, um, that was my final episode. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe, yeah, they ate, they ate, uh, they, so there was some cannibals on the show. Right, right. Uh, at this place called Terminus, and they caught my character, and and what had happened, we went, so the characters, they went to this one location, and my character had gotten bitten. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to tell the rest of the squad. Like, I had a love interest, um, Sonequa, Martin yeah. Green. Uh-huh. Um, um, I'm, I can't, why am I blanking on her, her character's name right now? Uh, Sasha, who's mm-hmm. playing Sasha. And so I didn't want to tell Sasha and everybody else on the crew that I had been bitten. So I left the group. And then I got caught by the cannibals. And then oh. I woke up and my leg was gone. And they were eating it in front of me. <laughs> oh, I, I missed that part. I didn't see that part, to be honest. But damn! <laughs> yeah. And then I had, which was, so in the book, that was a different character's death. Mm, okay. But it was a very iconic death in the graphic novel. So I was very lucky and fortunate that they gave my character that death. Because there was this very famous iconic line where he screams, "Tainted meat, tainted meat, you're eating tainted meat." Yeah, yeah. And so I got to, I got to do that line. And now, you know, that's one of the things. Walking down the street, and people are like, "Tainted meat," you know, say "tainted meat," yell "tainted meat," scream "tainted meat." <clears throat> people just love that scene. Um, and yeah, so that was a, it was a, it was a, a great, another great show, great opportunity, and I uh, had a great time doing it. Yeah. You know, Lawrence, here's the question I want to ask you. Um, even though it was a short film about a guy, uh, Turnip Speed, Second Chance. Oh, Turnip Speed, yeah. I want to know, okay, even though it was a short film, you met the guy, mm-hmm. you picked his brain, mm-hmm. but what did you notice? Did you change, did you try to sound like him with your voice and speech and the, the physicality? What did you do with that when you met him, Mac? Well, I did try to. I did try to do some of the physicality of him mm-hmm. and some of the voice because he's from Minneapolis, right? You know, Minnesota. So I tried to do a little bit uh, of that with him, but not too much. Not 
I mean, you know, it's kind of like, you know, what's that movie um, where he's like, if you go, you can't go full retard. Like, you can't go full. I think it's Tropic Thunder. That's the name of it, right? Uh -huh. So it's like, you can't go, you can't try to go full into somebody else because sometimes it'll just come off as, as you know. caricature. It's caricature-y. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you don't want that. So, so but you found it. You found it within yourself, right? You said, "Okay, I think this is truthful. Right. I'm, I'm kind of close, but I just don't want to be right. 100 percent because then you're copycatting and it doesn't look real on it, on screen. It, it won't be real, exactly, right. doing that kind of thing. So, but he was a very, very nice guy, very fun guy, but a very serious guy. Mm -hmm. And we talked a lot. And like I said, I picked his brain. And what you do when you do that, you know, you talk to the people who actually live the life. Is that's what builds your backstory, so that when you're delivering your lines and you're doing your thing. It has, you know, it, it has something that's kind of supporting it when you're delivering it. Right. You know what I mean? It gives you that support. So when you're delivering it, it feels real. Like, yes, I lived that experience. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was it, it was a great show. We actually did three parts to it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, we did three parts to it, and it was a it, it was it was great fun to do. And he's a great guy. No, but John listen, Tennessee. it's it's really hard. Well, you know, it, it is a little easier when the person's alive, but when the person's dead and you got to portray, that's really hard. Yeah. You know? At least you got. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? As an actor, I I, I totally understand. Yeah, because you got to go to the videotape. You got to get as much tape as you can mm -hmm. and, and try to you know, especially if it's an iconic person. Like I just finished doing. I did a film. <clears throat> um, as a matter of fact, I have to be in New York tomorrow to do some ADR on it. It's called uh, One Night in Miami. Where I play um, Ali's uh, 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 assistant trainer, Bodini Brown. Mm. Right now, Bodini Brown. If you look at any Ali Ali tapes of Ali in the ring, you'll see Bodini in there hugging him, and you know, and Bodini was the guy who wrote all of like the little jingles of Ali's, like float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, right. rumble young rumble, and all that. Bodini. So he's an iconic guy, like people know who he is. So I went in, you know, and I, I, I had to watch tape on him, you know, listen to him talking and all that kind of stuff and try to do my best to, to, to portray, you know, the actual guy best I could. So we'll see. I mean, I don't know what good, I'm going to do some ADR on it tomorrow, so I'll see what it looks like. <laughs> oh, we'll see. I, you know what, Lawrence, I believe in you. Don't worry about it. You'll bang it out, knock it out of the park. Come on now. All right, so then... You know, we're going to skip a little, you know, three years ago, you got the deuce. Now, listen, first of all, I know if I read the script and I'm saying mostly night shots and I'm going to deal with prostitutes, were you like, <laughs> holy shit, in the 70s? I think my wardrobe's going to be great. <laughs> you, like, <laughs> How exciting was it for you to show up, you know, change into your 70s outfit? And it was mostly yeah. night shots, right? So yep. the best thing about it, your lunch will be at like 2 a.m., right? Like it was, yeah. it was the best gig, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, man, I'll tell you, it was a blast. And like for me, those period kind of pieces mm -hmm. are the best for me. Like I love that kind of thing, transforming into a character, but also being transported back in time. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that kind of thing. Because you get to, when you do the research for that kind of thing, you know, I got to, I made a playlist for every season, you know, a playlist for the 70s, the early 70s, you know, a music playlist for the mid 70s, a music playlist for the 80s. You know, you get to, I went, I watched all the movies, like I watched Serpico and uh, Cross 110th Street, like all those black exploitation films of the time. And, <clears throat> you know, the I watched every Oscar winning movie of the early 70s. Like, you know, you get to just go back and do all that research to, to uh, build a backstory for your character. I follow, like, I, I learned who all the, the, the Knicks were of the 70s, like who were playing on those teams yeah. of the 70s. <laughs> wow. And the Giants. And the like, Yankees. I tried, to memorize, <laughs> tried to memorize all the players so that if I wanted to improv, like, oh, my God, did you see, you know, right. you know did you see Clive Jack or whatever, you know, playing that day, or any of the players, you know, I wanted to have it fresh in my mind. Um, so yeah, you know, um, now was it yeah, offered Clyde to you? Was it offered? Huh? Was it offered to you, Lawrence? So that was kind of because it was David Simon and Nina Noble. And oh, I did okay. go, they know you already. <laughs> so they knew my work. 
So, but they did have me come in because they never see me. You know, when I when I was last on one of their shows, I was on the other side of the law. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. <laughs> and now you're protecting the law. <laughs> now I'm on this side of the law, right? So they did have me come in, <clears throat> but they already knew right. what I could do for the most part. And that made it a little bit easier uh, for me to go in and do it. Um, you, you know what's so, so yeah. And, you know what's so great about it? It's like you see the streets of New York in the seventies. You see how messy it is. You know that was great. I mean, you know what's playing in the theaters in the seventies? How dirty New York City was. They were really specific. I was watching that the other day, and I was like, all right, all right, they're specific. I like this. <laughs> They got it so right, bro. They got it so right. And that's the thing. That's what's good about everybody knows them, you know, about that team, about David Simon, George Pelicanos, Nina Noble, Eber. They know that when you're working with them, they're going to get it right, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> as far as just everything, just the characters, the writing, the um, the, the set design, everything is going to be right on point. And sure enough, man, being on those sets, you felt like you were back in the 70s in dirty, you know, poor New York. Yeah. New York was poor. At oh, yeah. The city. Um, and just scary down there in, in, in Times Square was scary. It's not the Disneyland that it is today. Um, and so, yeah, man, you know, you feel like for me personally, I do something like that. I feel it makes you feel like you were a part of it. And you get to talk to the cats, to the cops that were back there during that day you know, during that time. And a lot of them told me because there was a lot of corruption in the police department back then. Mm -hmm. They were like, you know, I was like, was everybody dirty? And they're like, you know, everybody had to be a little bit dirty or else you couldn't be trusted. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, you had to be a little bit, even if you were a good cop and wanted to, you had to cross the line a little bit or nobody would trust you. Right. You know? And I'm like, well, why, what made like guys just want to be cops? He's like, man, every, and they were like every, all the cops said the same thing. He's like, I wanted to become a cop to protect and serve. That's why everybody wants to do it. They want to help the good guy, help people and protect and serve. What happens after that, <laughs> right? you know, you know what's going to happen, you know, in the course of life of people or whatever things happen, but they all start out just wanting to be good guys. Yeah. You know, Lawrence, what's it like? You know, this is the best, right? Like, you, when you see a picture of this, and you're on the billboards in New York City, and you, and you, you <laughs> say to yourself, holy shit, look at me, man. I can't believe this, right? I mean, anybody ever stop you and say, hey, is that you up there? <laughs> People do. People do. People yeah. do. It's, um, it's always amazing. Like that one, I think that was my fourth time being on a billboard in Times Square. Mm -hmm. So, and it's always feels like the first time, you know, when you see yourself on the side of a bus or you see yourself in a subway, you know, or you see, and you know, in Times Square, it's always, I remember, I remember the first time when Straight Outta Brooklyn came out and getting on the subway and I get to a subway stop and the door open and I look out and I see myself on a poster in the subway. <laughs> on that poster that you had up there. Mm -hmm. And I freaked out. I was like, holy crap. Like, I'm on a poster in, the, you know. Yeah. In New York City. New York City, especially. New York City. I mean, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty awesome. I mean, all you can do is just be humble and, and, and you know, just enjoy the blessing that it is, which I do every time. You know, I'm just like, wow, that's amazing. Like, I'm this kid from the hood in New York who came to the hood in Baltimore and I get to stand here and look at myself on this billboard in Times Square, like, you know, you, oh my you, God. you don't, yeah. you can't, you don't, you don't even create that in your brain as a kid, you know, or like I come home or I go to a toy store and I'm like, I pick up a doll in an action figure and it's me, you know, my character on the walking dead as an action figure with my likeness. It's like you, you don't dream of stuff like that, it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Lawrence, here's my question. Well, you know, have you ever like listened to a conversation and they're talking about The Walking Dead or The Deuce or whatever? Like, can, did that ever happen? You're on, you're in New York or wherever, and people are talking about the show. And if they only knew that you're that serious, I'm right? Wrong, on the show. I'm right there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it absolutely. Did happen. Oh my god, it happened many times in different places. I remember one time I was in this restaurant in L.A. I was in a restaurant in L.A. and mm -hmm. sitting me next to me in the restaurant in L.A. We're like these old Italian cats. Mm -hmm. 
like three or four of them is just sitting there. <clears throat> and one of them comes out and he's like, oh, man, you got to see this new show, The Wire. It's a, you got to see. And they start going on about The Wire, <laughs> right? And I'm sitting right next to them. Right? They don't know that you're in there, right? They're like, they ain't recognize you yet. <laughs> Oh, right. And they're going on and on about how much they love the show and you got to watch this show. You got to watch it. But that motivates then, you even more, right? Lawrence and shit like, oh, hell yeah, man. I can't wait for my next, you know, I'm going to be, be prepared. The, you know, these people are talking about it, right? Like, it motivates you. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's, it's, it, it does motivate you. For me, it's mostly just humbling. I'm like, man, that's pretty, it's just pretty awesome. I'm like, you know, and, and, and when people come up to you and they know your name, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and you didn't grow up with them, you know, yeah. and they know they know you, they know who you are. That's all just blessings, and it's amazing, it, it, and it really humbles me, and it really makes me like when stuff like that happens. It actually, when I get a new role or a new part, I'm like, I really got to do justice to this part, to this role, to this character, because you know, people are watching. Yeah, you know, people are watching, and you want to do your best for the people, for your fans, for the people who are watching, and so. It does motivate me, yeah. Well, you know, it's because of this gentleman right here. We're gonna, I'm gonna put this scene right here, a short scene. It's because of him I got you on my show. All right, here, let's let's take a look right here. All right, here it is. History? Lots of it. All props related. <laughs> Soliciting, loitering, going back to '69. Nothing in the last six years or so. Call those the California years. You heard Constantine caught one last night too, right? In a car. Independent activity. He's writing, right? What's that looking like? Yep, that's right. Mob related. Gambino times. The summer heat's starting to get to everybody. <laughs> it's always like that in August. Well, look at you with the tie, all frustrated, like trying to solve a case. Trash. Trash. Misdemeanor homicides. So, son of a bitch. That was during. That was supposed to be during the heat wave. Oh, by okay. the name Ashley. The heat wave back, back in, in New York, in New York where, where um. They had the heat wave, and then then there was the blackout. Remember the blackout? The year of the blackout. But they were, hold the on. The year of the son of Sam. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. All of that, that was that year. That was supposed to be that year. So that's why I had to tie that. I was playing that this is the hottest summer on the record mm -hmm. in New York. And I think we may have even said something about well, there's a crazy guy running around killing people. We may have said something. Yeah. But, yeah, man, that's George. That's your friend and my friend George right there. Um, and he you know, having some fun putting it down. George, you know, Lawrence, he said, I'll tell you, Eddie, you got to interview this guy, man. He is such a great guy. You have no idea what he did for me. I'm like, what do he do? He says, listen, I had a play and I needed <laughs> a black guy on my, in my play and I couldn't find nobody. <laughs> and he called you and he's like, listen, if you can, you know what I mean? I know <laughs> it's too, you know. Look, my character. There's much more lines. You would, you were about, you were declining at first. You're like, I can't get ready in two weeks for this. He's like, listen, exactly. my character's even harder. Trust me, you'll do it. And you're like, all right, come on, let's go. So you flew in from where? Where do you live right now? Uh, I didn't. I drove. I'm, I'm now in Maryland. I ha well, I live. I have a house in Maryland, and I have an apartment in New York. So I go back and forth. Oh, okay. But um, so I was in Maryland when he reached out to me. And you actually came in and did the play. I did. I did. I you... came in. It was. It was nuts, bro. I. I mean, now looking back on it, I still think to myself, what were? What was I thinking? I... <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but you know what? I mean, if nothing's going on, why not, right? Let me enhance my uh, acting, you know, right? That's what we do. You know, yeah. that's what we do. And if there's an opportunity and you're not doing anything, just why not? Just go right. and do the take take advantage of the opportunity. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done to go in there and try to learn learn that material in two weeks and and and, and do that, man. But you know, we pulled it off, got it done. It was uh. It was a great time. You know, it's like you're going, it's, it feels like, you know, you're going to war. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So when you come out and everybody's alive and all is good, you know, you build like a band of brothers, you know, you build a band of brothers. So that's what it was like, you know, with those cats. We were in there for two weeks just hitting it, hitting it, hitting it hard. And we, we put the show up and we got through it and, and boom, yeah. Oh, that's unbelievable. And you know what, he, what else he told me uh, on the set of The Deuce? You were actually looking for him because he went and he, he went to get lunch and then you finally found him when he came like, yo, where were you? He's like, 
well, you know, I just wanted to get a sandwich. Like, man, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to hang with you. And he's like, what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, he, he's yeah, so yeah. humble. He's such a great guy, George, man. He's, he's a, such great, a great guy. guy yeah. he is. He's, a, he's a good guy. He is. He really is. He really is. And, you know, yeah, I mean, that's what, it, it, you, you know, when, what I try to do when I'm on set and people come on, my whole objective is to just try to make people feel as comfortable as possible on set and especially around me. Right. You know, I get to work with like, you know, in season in, in, in season two, there was a girl who came on and she was playing my love interest in season two. It was her first time on a TV show. Mm. First time on the camera. She was so nervous. She had so many questions, you know, yeah. and I, so I'm always just trying to be there, sort of just, you know, be, being understanding, being a shoulder, being an ear to hear and listen and, you know, be some kind of guidance and help, some kind of help yeah. and just make people feel comfortable and easy so we can have fun. Well, and that's how it was yeah. with George when I met him. I'm like, I mean, George is a pro already, but I'm like, yo, bro, let's just have some fun. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what it is, Lawrence, they, they did it to you when you were younger because, you know, you're a veteran actor. You, you've been in the game for years. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's your turn as a veteran to, you know, get that, young, yeah, cool. you know, a non experience or a little experience because, you know, you, you do get nervous when you're out there like, oh, shit, I'm on the deuce. Oh, my God. You know what I mean? He's yeah, one of the yeah. serious regulars, you know, they're thinking like that, you know, like, oh, my yeah. God. What? Oh, my God. I got to I got to execute this. And then, you know, this pressure, this tightness. And then it's your job yeah. as a veteran actor to say, hey, I got you. Don't worry about it. Let's just enjoy this, yeah. you know. Lawrence, all yeah. I have to say, you're the best. Seriously, I, I'm glad you're my 26th interview. Okay, 26. I, uh, That's a good number. 26. 26 since April 10th. I started because I said to myself, "What am I going to do now? I can't audition. I can't do nothing. Okay, I'm going to read plays, but I gotta, I gotta, I gotta have a show. <laughs> you know, so. Nice, man. But Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You know. I, I, I really appreciate you coming on, seriously. It means a lot to me. But don't go anywhere. I got a couple of questions. I'm going to end it live. Just let me uh, end this right now. But here he is, Lawrence Gilliard Jr. in the house, baby. <laughs> All right, hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eddie, I meant to tell you there's this story where I met Bernie Williams. We were on a flight. From Boston to L.A. And I'm sitting there and I look to my left and I'm like, oh, crap, that's Bernie Williams. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I totally like geeked out and, and had a fanboy moment. I was like, would you mind taking a picture? And he he recognized me and was like, no, nah, sure. Come on. So we took the picture. And then when we get down to the baggage claim, he's down there with his guitar. Yeah, yeah. And. I didn't know, like, I, I remember sort of hearing that he played guitar, but I didn't know that he went to music school yes. first. Oh, yeah. Right? And so we ended up riding together in the car, right, going to the hotel. Wow. And he started telling me all these stories. He's like, yeah, man, I, was, I wanted to be a musician, and then I got, you know, drafted, and I went to play for the Yankees, and but really, and then after the Yankees, he went back to school to play music. So, of course, me being a musician, him being a musician, and we just vibed on the whole music thing. And, and you know, we were in L.A. He invited me to come and see him play live in concert for the Jackie Robinson Memorial Concert. Oh, wow. It was like his birthday, the Jackie Robinson birthday concert. He invited me. He gave me two tickets to come. And I got to go, and I got to go backstage and hang out with everybody backstage and be Bernie Williams' guest. He gave me his number. I hit him up. And now me and Bernie are, like, like, like tight like that. Wow, that's a great story, man. <laughs> Holy shit. Good for you. Look at I'm that. Trying to get, I was trying to get him to come and jam because, you know, I told you I play drums. So I'm like, we got to get together and do a jam session, bro. But, you know, I might, it's Bernie Williams. I might have to pay him to just come and jam with me. <laughs> He's the type of guy he he'll be like, let's go. He he he's 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 into I it. Know, he's cool. It's equivalent to you with that clarinet back in Juilliard. Trust me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a great story. Hey, this is Lawrence Gilliard Jr. Please subscribe to Eddie Mata's YouTube channel. You're gonna love it. He's great and funny as hell. <laughs>